Hey, hey, welcome back. Today's episode is fire. We had filmed the first interview, which was episode three, back in March of 2020, and I quickly realized that I had to reevaluate how we went forward with these interviews because scheduling several in person interviews in one day was not going to be an option. So, this episode was recorded back in the summer of 2020. And it was just Jasmine and I and the video team. Shout out to Vanessa and Elio from 41 Films. Um, But I wanted to make the most of our time together. And so we had a more in-depth conversation and really dove deep into our stories, into our work, and specifically how we both have had to shift our perspectives on our worth as Latinas. Jasmine is an amazing orator, and she shares so much wisdom every single time I hang out with her. She is a photographer, she's the founder of a nonprofit, and a huge advocate for mental health, and she's also my friend. So please enjoy our conversation. I'm so excited to have Jasmine here. We know each other uh, from the wedding industry. We've been friends for probably over five years. Yeah. I think so. Um, But we always have like these meaningful conversations where I walk away feeling so loved, so inspired, so encouraged. And so I'm just so glad that she can be here to have a conversation with me today. She is the co-founder and executive uh, director of a nonprofit. She's an artist. She's a photographer. She does all the things, and she's also your oily best friend, which we will get into later. Um, but I'm just so excited to talk to you today yeah, about excited. all the things. I know. I'm excited too. I can't wait. Yeah. So why don't we start out from the beginning, from when we first met in the wedding industry? Tell me about that. Yes. So we have a mutual friend um, that we both worked with. And I'll never forget, she shot me a DM and was like, I need to introduce you to my friends, Karina. Um, you guys have so much in common. You guys both have kids, you both homeschool, and you're both photographers. And I was like, yeah, send me your information. And then it wasn't until I think we actually met up where I realized that you were Latina too. Yeah. Um, and that was, I think you were one of my first Latina friends in the industry where we really began to have some of these dialogues and conversations around what does it mean to be Latina working in a predominantly white space? Yeah, I feel like, yes, that was the first time. I feel like we were challenging each other without actually knowing it. Yes. And I feel like we went through the whole uh, journey of, and we'll get into the journey, but like realizing the space that we were in and our role in it Mm -hmm. um so yeah i'm thankful that you started that conversation and we started it together and yes yes, i forgot to say she's also a homeschool mom or she was a homeschool mom and that's how that's another way that we connected Mm -hmm. um because we don't or at least at that time i did not have many uh latina homeschool mom Mm -hmm. influences Mm -hmm. and so i didn't know that other Latinas were also homeschooling and so that was another thing that I feel like it just clicked and we're just like oh my goodness Mm -hmm. we need to be friends yes yes um (laughs) yeah so can you go a little bit deeper Mm -hmm. about how the wedding industry as a whole is a, a predominantly white space and how we realized our role in that Yeah, absolutely. So I think for me, so I've been working in the industry for, oh gee, how long has it been? Like over 10 years now. Um, And I think one of the first things I noticed was just how segregated our wedding industry is. Um, Meaning that if it's a Latino wedding, typically all the vendors are Latino. If it's a Russian wedding, it's all Russian vendors. Um, And so I just began to see how much these spaces were so segregated and just some of the marketing strategies that I think were taught, like show what you want to book. Um, The demographic is typically more affluent, bigger budgets, and that's typically um, those who are Caucasian. And so for me personally, I felt like in order for me to have access to a space that I've never been in, I have to figure out how do I almost assimilate or how do I deny 
who I am so that um, I can be able to be seen and that my work can show for itself and get hired then and then after assimilating realizing that that's not enough actually that I'm, I still wasn't chosen and I would still not get booked and then I would get challenging comments like you're not worth what you're charged, what you're charging, um, you know, oh, I didn't realize you charged that much. And so there was a lot of like brokenness that I was experiencing in it. And I think because I had disconnected from my own sense of self and my own cultural identity, um, I didn't know how to process through that healthily. Because at that time, I didn't have other mentors or other Latinas in the industry who were going through or experiencing some of the things that I was experiencing. And I don't really think this was a conversation or dialogue that was happening during that time period either. Um, especially when I was just starting out. It was more like, how do I get, how do I get these like beautiful, pretty <laughs> couples yeah. to book me when I'm not in that circle, when I don't live in that space, when I don't shop in those spaces, when I'm not, when I don't fit that, when I don't look what I'm trying to um, hire or be hired for um, and so those were some of the internal struggles that I personally struggled with and went through yeah and I feel like I was also like I took the workshops that told you this is how you get booked mm -hmm. and I was doing all of the things and I was like I'm still not getting the same success as my other friend who is doing this exact same things that I'm doing mm -hmm. like why is that it's it like, I thought it was something wrong with me. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And I even, I don't know if I shared this story with you, but I went to a client meeting, and at that time, like, it was, so, backstory, I work with my husband on weddings, and so he is white. And I went to this client meeting, and it was just me. And they actually asked me, they're just like, but your husband's white, right? And I said yes and they're just like okay we just want to make sure that you know your husband's i think they like backtracked or they didn't know what to say and after that i was like i was shocked i'm like you are asking me if i like they were to my face saying that i alone did not have enough value to photograph their wedding mm -hmm. and they just wanted to make sure that there was someone going, that was going to be there that was white. And after that, like, I felt, I feel like that's when the shift started to happen. Mm. And it was something that I, I talked to my husband about, but I couldn't really process mm. why I was feeling that way because I had, I had tried to assimilate and put myself in these spaces thinking that if I just did, um, XYZ mm -hmm. that I would be able to get the same success as everyone else and I feel like that was that turning point that no it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if you do all of the things if you have the nice uh, clothes if you have the nice investment guide if you don't if you, it didn't matter yep. um, and so yes I feel like that was a huge realization that I was ascribing to things that I thought would work mm -hmm. and they didn't just mm -hmm. because of the color of my skin. And I feel like when I would talk to you, like we would experience these things on our own, mm -hmm. but then when we would talk about it, we'd be like, Oh my goodness. It's yeah. not just me. Yeah. It's not like just an isolated experience. Mm -hmm. This is something that is systemic across the board. Um, and I think for me, a turning point was after I started getting all these inquiries and people not wanting to book me, even though my work was comparable to who they ended up booking, um, I believed the lie that it was, that I was being judged, right? And, and not the lie, but what I did was to respond out of it was I changed my name. So my business at the time was Jazzy Photo. And so I changed my name and... And, and my last name is Lopez, so I'm Jasmine Lopez, um, you know, the most, one of the, like, top five Latino popular last names. And so for me, I was, like, I'm being judged by, by what I look like, by my name. And so what would it look like if I cut out my name and only use Jazzy? 
Um, and that way, it would help me to be seen more and not be so quickly associated to the Lopez last name. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, there's these stereotypes, right, within the Latino community. When you think about it, how it plays out in other industries. Mm -hmm. Like, when you want, you know, an affordable or cheap mechanic, you hire a, a Latino or a Mexican, oftentimes. Mm -hmm. uh, someone to clean your house, a landscaper. And so you see a lot of these stereotypes then be transferred over to those of us who are doing creative things or in the creative industry. And there's this assumption that because we're Latino, we charge less than our counterparts. Even though our experience, our portfolio, everything we're doing is the same thing. But yet there's this assumption that we charge less and so therefore we must charge less. Yeah. Yeah. So talk more about the name change. Yes. Jazzy Photo. Tell me like how that journey. Yes. So about three years ago, I'll never forget, I was scrolling through my Instagram and I, as I'm looking through, I'm like, oh my gosh, like this does not look like me. This does not represent who I really am. And I just felt like I was going through this process of, I, it, it was a moment in time. It was like almost a pause where it was like two paths that I could decide to walk down. I could continue to go down the path I was going down, which at this point, you know, I was doing in-person sales, doing really well with that kind of thing, had a studio in Riverside, um, which is an affluent white community. Um, and so I, I had, I was at this pivotal moment where I was like, I could either do one or two things, um, continue down the path I'm going, or I can um, redefine and what this means and what this looks like and embark in the truth and celebrate the truth of who I am and all of who I am as a mom, as a Latina, as, um, as a person of faith, as someone um, who was married to someone where we both didn't have fathers in our home and are trying to change the legacy in our family. And so what does that look like? And so I began to do some, a lot of unpacking, a lot of learning, a lot of gaining language for the experiences that I was experiencing in the wedding industry and also in other spaces that I was in. Um, because prior to that moment, we weren't really in white spaces. We were we went to Latino churches, black churches. Um, we did life with people of color. That's just our everyday life. And so it wasn't until, you know, getting into more white spaces where we started experiencing being fetished or experiencing being tokenized or experiencing, um, you know, like, oh my gosh, you speak Spanish, you're from Puerto yeah. Rico, like that. Ah. <laughs> and I had never experienced that before. And so in this season, I had to really partner it with God and be able to um, really say, who is Jasmine? Not Jazzy. Who is Jasmine Lopez? And how do I reconcile and celebrate all of who I am and what does that mean and what does that look like? And I knew that if I wanted to move forward in where I was going with photography and my passion, I couldn't just rebrand Jazzy Photo. I had to end it and start something new. And that's what I did. Um, and so my husband and I together came up with the name called Authentic Adventure. And um, it was through that where we were just like, uh, this represents and celebrates all of who we are. And we're going to celebrate the highs and the lows. Because I think that's another thing I really struggled with after going to all the workshops and hearing people talk about like how I made six figures my first year. I'm like, that's yeah. such a lie. <laughs> um, I really wanted to create our, our brand to celebrate our highs and our lows because I wanted people to see the in-between of how we got to where we're getting to today. And we're not there yet, right? We're still learning, we're still growing. We, we haven't hit financial numbers that we have longed and aspired to get to. But in that process, we wanna show people what that looks like and what that means and how you can do that in, truly out of the fullness of who we are and not um, based on what society and culture says we should do. Yes, for sure. And I feel like, like you said, that goes against what the industry workshops mm -hmm. are teaching because they're, they're saying, or they were like five years ago, like you need to be niche down and don't talk about everything else. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's what I had done. Like people that I would meet didn't even know I had kids or that I homeschooled and I was trying to keep everything so separate mm -hmm. and I was one person when I would go to networking events 
and I was another person when I was like at home with the kids and trying to like teach them Spanish. I was another person with my family. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I saw you doing that and I was like, oh, what is she doing? I'm like, this is awesome, but I don't know how this works. Yeah. Um, I didn't know how it worked either. Yeah. And I think what helped me in the process is I named it and I shared it on Instagram mm -hmm. with my people, my family, my friends. And I was like, this is where I'm at and this is what it's going to look like. And I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know what this means, but I'm going to do it because I feel like this is what I need to do in yeah. order to be fully who I am as Jasmine. Yeah. And I think that was the best thing that you could have done. Uh, I feel like a lot of people have been able to look to you as an example mm -hmm. to be okay with opening up and be okay with sharing more of themselves mm -hmm. or at least diving in and looking inwardly to question that, that mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I was going through that internal tension uh, myself at around the same time mm -hmm. and I appreciated you sharing it publicly because it gave me like um, I, I don't know it gave me hope that mm -hmm. I wasn't alone even mm -hmm. though at that time I wasn't ready to share publicly because I didn't have the words I feel like yeah um, especially because I was married to or I am married to someone who is white and so like our experiences are completely different mm -hmm. and what like as we're raising bicultural biracial kids like that conversation looks a lot differently and I was learning the language to be able to um like celebrate our my culture while also finding uh the words to positively talk about my husband's culture. Yeah. Um, and so at that point, I don't think I had even acknowledged his culture. Mm. And the kids did not even know that they were like half German. They thought that my husband was Mexican just because that's all we talked about mm. at the, in our home. Mm -hmm. And I had made such a separation of that part of my life and our lives that the kids didn't even know okay. um, and it's yes it was it's been a journey but I it was interesting because I was one person at home celebrating like my heritage my culture but then when I went out into the world mm -hmm. I was embracing my husband's culture and trying to assimilate mm -hmm. to that so I feel like yeah it was a it was a it was a journey for me to be able to share more publicly mm -hmm. um, but I feel like your influence has really influenced a lot of people mm -hmm. especially me mm -hmm. in yes. finding the words and like feeling okay that I'm I'm confused as to why I'm not at the same level as other people who are doing the same things mm -hmm. as I was um, so yeah yeah and i think if i can speak into that i those were similar thoughts that i struggled with and i personalized it as well what am i doing wrong then mm -hmm. and not understanding that there are actual systems that exist um not that you know not to play into like a victim mentality but also understanding the tension of the fact that systems exist and um, different privileges exist and all of those things and so trying to figure out how does someone who comes from a low-income home or or upbringing now get into a spirit influence where affluence is because typically it's like I think the percentage is like 80% of white wealth stays with white wealth so it's like how does someone who's not white who comes from a lower income tap into a network that I don't have access to um, and so I think that's something we need to talk more about is like, what does that look like? And how do we do that? And how do we say that there is enough of the pie for all of us to be successful? And how do we get a seat at the table? And maybe not at the seat at the table, then maybe how do we create our own table? And what does that look like? And what does that mean? Yeah. And that, like speaking on creating your own table, yeah. I feel like that's what we have been uh, doing like separately, but also together, like mm -hmm. just talking about like, who do we know that we can 
um, bring together for these conversations. Mm -hmm. And I, that brings me to your, your actual bringing together at the table. Um, do you want to share a little bit about like your idea or how you have actually brought people together around the table to have these conversations? Yeah. So in what context? In the at the table event? So yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I have dreamed of, like, I love, I have always loved, as a little girl, I have always loved the areas of justice. I've seen how it has played out in my life and it's something that I'm truly grateful for. It wasn't anything that was taught to me because I feel like I experienced a lot of anti-blackness growing up because um, my family, um, I'm pretty light-skinned, but my family is actually has very strong Euro-centric um, features. So very, very pale, white, white skin with colored eyes, blonde hair that then turned dark. Um, so I was the dark girl in my family. And so as a result, I experienced a lot of anti-blackness. Um, and in the midst of that, and not as a little kid, not having language for it, I've always been drawn to different cultures, um, different people, people of color, learning about um, culture, learning about countries. And so that just is something that naturally comes to me that I love and see value in yeah. and didn't realize that that isn't how everybody sees each other. And so as I've grown up and um, as I've developed and changed this brand to Authentic Adventure, something I wanted to start was called At The Table. And it's it's in different kinds of events. It could be workshops, it could be dinner, it could be um, like an art opportunity to like do watercolor, different things like that. But really the goal is to bring all people together, women I should say, um, bring all people together um, of different races, ethnicities, but also class. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, oftentimes when we talk about being in relationship with friends and having diverse circles, typically we stick with, um, when we have diverse circles, it's typically um, ethnically and racially, but not class difference. Mm -hmm. And so, because we stick with what we know with and what we're comfortable with. So if we live in a certain community, we stick in that community. And so at the table is this idea of what does it look like to bring all of those three intersections together? And not being like identifying, oh, you're the poor person, you're the more wealthier person, but truly bringing together a diverse group of women together to embark on relationship and to have a dialogue. Um, what does that mean and what does that look like? Even even different seasons of life. Some of the women that came were single, some were married, some were divorced, some have children, some don't. Um, and so really making sure that there's true diversity in the circle so that it brings value to each of our lived experiences. And I truly believe that's when we get to learn from each other, when we can come and sit at the table and have a dialogue around whatever topic, but there's different voices there being represented and listened to in that process. Yes. So that's what at the table is. Um, due to COVID, we haven't been able <laughs> yeah. to do it but right before COVID happened we hosted a, um, a watercolor workshop and it was beautiful gathered different women together it was just a time to self-reflect and focus inward and partner that with art um, and so it's something I truly care about and am passionate about and once we can start meeting in person again we'll start planning what these future at the table events can look like yeah, for sure. And I was so excited to uh, take part in yeah. one of them. Um, and so I hope that, yeah, we, yeah. Can, we can do this again. <laughs> yes, and what's so cool is that um, many, many of the ladies have now become friends. They all follow each other on Instagram. Um, I met with one friend the other day and she's like, yeah, I just had friend with another, I just had lunch with another friend that was at the table gathering. Mm -hmm. And so it's so neat to see how creating the space then can create another type of space for deeper relationships and friendships to be formed, even if we don't look the same, live the same, or believe the same. So I know that it take it took like a huge journey and a huge like pivot point to get you to where you are now. Mm -hmm. So do you want to share all of the things that you're doing now? Yeah, it's a lot. So yeah. I have to give kind of some backstory. Yeah. Um, so we moved to a community called Maywood, Illinois. Um, it's a predominantly African American Latino community. 
uh, with a growing Latino population. And so we purchased the house there, oh my gosh, it's like three and a half years now. And I remember, um, this was uh, this, three and a half years ago, this is when I was starting my entire process of like, basically like de deconstructing my identity and all of these things. And so when we moved to Maywood, it was a struggle at first for me because um, I don't know about you and what, what it was like in your context, but for me growing up in a lower income home with a, a single mom, there's this idea or this belief that like you move to like an affluent white community and you never look back. Like you don't move to black and brown communities. Like that is a sign of success. Um, and so when we purchased the property three and a half years ago and it wasn't a community that's black and brown, I was like, man, and it, because we were in white spaces, I was like, why can't we live in the West Loop like the rest of our friends? Um, and in the beginning, I had this really poor attitude about why we were there. And I'll never forget, I had gone on a vision, a vision trip to um, El Salvador with our church, and it revolutionized my whole mind, my whole thinking about the whole thing. And basically what I learned out there is that poverty is multifaceted. It's not just lack of resources. It's broken relationships, it's abuse of power, um, and so many other things. And what I loved what, about this nonprofit in El Salvador and what they're doing is, is that they don't take the approach or the mindset that they're American coming to El Salvador to save El Salvador. They believe that the solutions and the needs can be met by the community. And so what they do is they partner with the church um, and they show them that they can be the hands and feet of Jesus in their own communities. And so for me, I was just like, man, I wonder if there's a deeper reason, a deeper purpose as to why we've, why we've moved to Maywood. And so when we came back home from that trip, I'm just like, my mind is just like all over the place. I'm like, okay, God, what are you trying to tell me here? What are you trying to say? And um, I just remember having this dialogue of looking around and, you know, on my block, my house was like one of the renovated houses. My next door neighbor had like a broken window and then on the other side was abandoned property. And so that's just pretty consistent within our community. And I remember looking around and just being like, but I don't know how to fix houses. That's not something that, that I can do. Um, and so I'm like, but I am a creative, I'm a photographer, and I have so many amazing creative friends in the industry. So what would it look like to get some sort of building or space where we can host workshops and teach these kind of um, skill sets to the youth in our community? And so, um, I don't know, that one night, as this idea was just like popped in my head, I went on the MLS and found a firehouse in the community that was for sale. And for me, again, I was like, if I'm going to invest in property or invest in getting a space, I would rather invest in my own community than go to a space outside of my community. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we found this firehouse <laughs> that I was just like, oh my gosh. And I had, again, I was so new in my process that I had a lot of like broken mindsets over myself and beliefs about myself. Um, as in addition to that, like a poverty mindset. So I was like, oh, we can't buy that. We can't afford that. And so it was this journey of not just unpacking my cultural identity and the truth of that, but the truth of breaking off poverty mindsets over myself. And so we went through this journey over the next year of what does it look like to try to purchase this firehouse? Can we do it? And so um, what we ended up having to do was sell the property to be able to purchase the firehouse. And that whole story is full of like miracles and just craziness. I won't get into the details of that, but um, we ended up buying a firehouse. <laughs> and I'll never forget when we got the keys to the house, I'm like, holy freak, this is real. <laughs> this just happened. Yeah. How did this happen? How did we get this? How did we get this property? Because they were like, at the same time, there was like two or three other offers on the table. And somehow we were the ones selected to get it. Um, and so that started this journey of starting this nonprofit called the Firehouse Dream, where we teach creative skill sets. And by we, I mean creative. So it's not me doing it. It's me partnering with other creatives to give back to the community or give back to their own communities. And um, it's, so we started the nonprofit about two years ago. We received our 501c3 last year. It took a, almost a year process <laughs> I remember of actually that. getting it, yeah. um, which was just like 
a season of growth. It was a season yeah. of pruning for me. It was a season of continual identifying truth within myself, again, gaining language um, for my experiences, and then also being new to nonprofit sector, seeing how power dynamics play out, really learning how systemic racism has impacted my community and how it's become what it's become today. Um, under, under resourced communities don't just become under resourced. There's a reason. There's systemic racism that's a part of, that plays into a factor of that. And so I needed to learn the history to understand what had happened to me what, and why it became how it's become. And I think one of the biggest um, misconceptions that I think in society and in America that we believe is that we don't care about our own communities and by we meaning the people who live in their own communities and that is the biggest lie ever. What I have learned over the last two years is that are so, there are so many of us who are invested in our communities who are desiring change, but we face challenges like resources or we don't have um, all the tools that we need to be able to make the difference that we hope to make. And not in addition to that, when we think about the philanthropic dollar that's available out there, it's like a, I want to say, I don't want to be misquoted, but I believe it's like a $400 million industry or billion, I can't remember if it's million or billion, but in all of that, Latino-led nonprofits only get 1.1% of the, of the pie, mm -hmm. which means that we are underrepresented, our voices aren't being considered, our stories and lived experiences aren't being considered, and so I sit in that tension of, wow, first of all, there's barely any Latina-led nonprofits in general, so that's a weight that I carry and an honor that I, that I hold as well, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I believe that this is a community-led nonprofit, and so what does that look like and what does it mean? I am not the face of the nonprofit. This is not about Jasmine's dream. It's about co-creating and partnering with the youth and the community to bring the solutions to the community. So that's a little bit about what we're doing now with the yeah. Firehouse Dream. Yeah, and I like how throughout this whole journey, you said it took like a year to get your 501c3, mm -hmm. and it was a three and a half year process from when you first bought your house in Maywood and you sold it to purchase the fire house. Yeah. Like you were sharing pretty openly about mm -hmm. the whole journey, and I feel like that piece is was and is so important because like you said, people don't know that this is happening or that communities like this, like Maywood, are that underrepresented, under, um, not financially poured into for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I appreciated you sharing that journey and the struggles, especially like doing all the paperwork yourself yeah. for the 501c3 and how you navigated through that during hard seasons. Because I know that there was a time when, I think it was like last year when the government was shut down mm -hmm. and what that meant for you yeah. and what that meant for you as a Latina nonprofit as opposed to a nonprofit that has money and has like the funds to push their paperwork mm -hmm. through and the knowledge to like call the specific offices to get your your paperwork pushed through yeah um and it was that was a challenge like constantly needing to and i think that's one of the challenges that often isn't considered is like you know for those of us who are trying to start these types of initiatives or projects or nonprofits, there is an element of need for like time freedom in order to do that. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of our community, we're working long days, multiple jobs. So time freedom to be able to do these kinds of ideas or living out of this dream that we have is a challenge. And so for me to, I'm grateful for the free time freedom. That is a privilege that I have. And so I sit in that tension and I recognize I mean, even with COVID, I think the numbers were like one in six Latino families can work from home and everyone else works as an essential worker. I had to sit in that tension and recognize this is my privilege. And so what am I going to do? 
and how I'm going to use my time freedom in a way that's advocating for my community and in a way that is saying, hey, our voice is here, it has value, and we are, like, don't miss it. Like, we are here, this is our perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so with that being said, with the nonprofit, with the government shutdown, I had to, like, call once a month. Sometimes it took, like, up to an hour to get through the line to just talk to somebody to see if there's an update. And then I remember um, one specific time I was given an update that it had been finally assigned to somebody. And then the next month I called back and they're like, no ma'am, it hasn't been assigned to anybody. And I was just devastated. I remember crying and just being like, what is happening? Like, why is this taking so long? I had this fear that it was literally just sitting on someone's desk, on some yeah. table. And so I had this fear it's gonna get lost. It's gonna, I, it's gonna take so much longer. But in the midst of that, I just felt like it was an invitation of don't miss what this season of waiting means for you and continue to do what you can do. So in that season of waiting for me, I was continuing to work on my inner self, continuing to go to therapy, uh, do some um, inner healing within my own identity because I can't lead something that's with I'm broken from myself within my own identity. Yeah. And then also building trust in the community. So showing up to board meetings, showing up to other community-led meetings, joining other nonprofits and their initiatives, um, and really building deeper relationships because that's one of the avenues of of poverty that the multifaceted that I mentioned, broken relationships. So if I can build relationships and build trust and um and for the season that I'm here in my community and let people know that I am here for the community and this is what it's going to look like and this is how I can advocate, then that's what I'm going to do. And so in that season of waiting, that's what I, that's the only option I had yeah. was just continuing to believe that this was going to happen um, while also doing what I can um, with the relationships that I had built in the community. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, so I'd like for you to paint a picture of what the firehouse looks like. I know you bought the firehouse yes. and I feel like in people's minds they might think of a firehouse looking a specific way. Can you talk us through like what it was like when you purchased it and all that you've like done, done yes. inside and outside to the space? Yes, so we just made two years in the firehouse in June. Um, and it looks completely different <laughs> now than what it looked like when we first bought it. Um, when we first purchased it, so it's, it's technically sectioned off in two levels. So the first level, or the garage, mm -hmm. is where the, it's um, originally where the horses were. Um, and then later on, around I think the 40s, is when they changed from horses to engines. So that's where the fire trucks or fire truck used to be stored. Mm -hmm. And then you go upstairs, and upstairs is the living area. So the previous owner, um, he was a carpenter, so he put a lot of work into like beautiful hardwood floors and all the wood detail, which I'm super grateful for, but he was not very keen to aesthetic style. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have transformed it into um, the upstairs, the living space where we're at, my husband and I and my three girls. Um, it's not really conducive for a family of five, but we call this we call this firehouse like our um, in between space. Like we knew that this is just a temporary living space um, for us to be able to purchase it for the non nonprofit, and then in a couple of years, our plan is to move out of it. Um, but in the meantime, we've you know decorated and styled it. We've um, done whatever renovations, DIY projects that we could. Um, and so the previous owner had done a huge chunk of the work upstairs, but hadn't done any work downstairs. And that's where most of the work needed to be done. So like, um, it's like, it's crazy how much it's been transformed, but we had to do all brand new electrical, um, which was kind of scary for us because we're like, oh my gosh, because it had its original electrical from the thing. Like early 1900s, it had never been redone. Yeah. So we had to do brand new electrical. Um, we painted all the brick to white. I wanted like this Manhattan style loft look. We don't have anything like that in Maywood. There's tons of beautiful loft spaces in Chicago, but we don't have anything like that. And so I'm like, I want this space to look beautiful. I want it to be like, this is for us. This is for the community. This is for the youth. Um, and so it's designed, very open space, lofty, um, 
Let's see what else. Um, the furniture that's in there, it's all mobile, so it's all on wheels so that we can move things around and be able to design the space according to whatever the specific needs are. We have a huge projection screen um, with a stage where we could do like podcasting, we can do um, speaker events, we're thinking like poetry slam, storytelling nights, and then we have a workshop station that we're talking about turning into like a maker's space. Um, that's going to have like a laser cutter. We have a large format printer that was donated to us earlier this year, which we're so grateful for. I have, we have a vinyl cutter. We're looking into possibly getting a DTG printer. Um, anything that could be entrepreneurial based for a youth where they can have access to tools and equipment, where they can turn an idea that they have into an actual business that's based around the creative industry. And so, um, so that that area, and then the last little area is our production area where we do music, um, video, cinematography, and my husband's over that area. Yeah, I know you do <laughs> all of this, um, and you just had a workshop yes. that I know that you had been talking about for a long time, mm -hmm. and you had this vision. Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like since I first heard about the Firehouse Dream, like this yes. has been your vision and to see it actually come to life, like I'm just so, so happy and so excited for you. Um, but tell me more about what you are already starting to do and like what your vision for the Firehouse Dream is like in next year, two years, five yes. years. So right now, because of COVID, everything got shut down. Prior to COVID, I was volunteering at the local high school, sponsoring the photo club. So we had a group of youth there. Um, and then COVID happened and we weren't able to meet up. And so in that process, um, we just finished as much of the res renovations as we could finish for phase one within mm -hmm. our being. So my husband basically DIY'd the rest of the stuff that had to get done because he just yeah. felt it so deep within himself where he was like, I need to finish this space. I don't know why, but I feel like it needs to be done. And then COVID happened and we we're like, oh yeah, because all the stores were shut down and we wouldn't have been able to do much while in the very beginning months of April and March, March and April. Um, so what we what we did this past week, or actually now, two weeks ago, um, we held our first one week intensive. And basically it was a five hour workshop where each day we covered a different topic. Um, we did um, financial literacy, brand identity, how do you build an authentic brand. Um, we did a day of photography, a day of film, and then a day of social media. How do you go viral? How do you uh, grow your social media? And we had about, it, it ranged from day to day, but we had anywhere from four to like eight youth come through and they got to learn uh, these different topics. And what was the coolest thing I think of the entire week is that the filming day, my husband led that day. Um, he taught them about storytelling and how to tell a story. And then in, after lunch for the second session, they actually filmed um, a music video of one of our youth playing the piano and they got to set up the shot. Um, he showed them how to do everything and then they got to like direct it. And then after that, they actually edited the film. So by the end of that specific workshop, our youth walked away with a finished product of a film so that they can show and say, hey, look, I was a part of this. This is what I did. So now they have job experience yeah. that they can add to their portfolio. Um, and then they have a final product that they can show. Um, and so everyone has access to that. And so really the goal is, is to teach our youth um, skill sets, a creative skill set, so that they can be able to gain entrepreneurial opportunities or have access to them working in the creative industry. And then we also, in the future, our goal is, and this is going to happen within the next few months, but once they go through the program, the hope is to have them be able to then have access to our equipment. Because what I'm realizing is that's the challenge. The challenge is not them being exposed to creativity because initially that's what it was. I thought it was mm -hmm. initially it was like, oh, we're gonna like show them creativity. We're gonna like bring them in, show them photography. And what I'm learning is that no, our youth are very, very one. They're into technology, so social media is huge. But they already have interests in photography, video, graphic design, podcasting. The thing is, is that they don't have the tools to help them to create the content that they're looking to create. 
So our goal now is to help basically allow them to have access to the tools so that they can start creating the content that they're looking to create in partnership with the Firehouse Dream. So whether they use the space or whether they use the equipment, it will help them to be able to start amplifying their stories and their voices based around the things that matter to them. Yeah, which is great because I feel like in the creative space, like all the tools and all the things that we use are so expensive. Mm -hmm. And even education itself is so expensive and a lot of people go into debt trying mm -hmm. to purchase and rather than um, like y using the, the money and the profit they might get from a job, mm -hmm. they have to then put that back because they've spent so much money on the tools and yep. the resources. Um, so I feel like it's like that is the piece like that is so needed and that nobody talks about because yeah. every, everyone always pushes education or oh just buy the expensive stuff and you'll be able to pay it back yeah. like just take a loan out um, but no one puts together that that financial piece mm -hmm. with the actual like reality mm -hmm. of, of people's financial place yeah. in, that they are in their in their lives um it's a huge yeah. it's a huge investment like i remember yeah. when i was at that cusp of needing to get my first 5d 5d3 mark and i was just like how am i where am i gonna get 3500 dollars for this like mm -hmm. how um and so i remember and we didn't for us well, we didn't do that we would do a little booking and then put that those funds and invest it back into purchasing new equipment. And we also took a season to um, live with family so that we can take what we were paying for rent and invest it into the business. But I know that's not everyone's story or opportunity. And so having the tools is a huge, huge, huge challenge for my youth. Um, I remember when the protests were happening, I had several youth reach out to me and say, hey, could you know, is there any way through the firehouse stream that we can use the equipment because I want to go to protests and photograph or document what's happening, but I don't have this lens or I don't have this camera. And so I'm like, ah, we need to figure this out because that's, we want to help bring the solution to the challenge. And so if they're saying we want to do X, Y, Z, but we don't have this. So my thing is, well, how do we meet the need of what it is that they need? Um, and it not be a thing of like, no, it has to be through the firehouse stream, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, no, it's how do we help meet the needs of the community and the youth and really listening to what they're saying so that we can figure out creative solution and strategy around it. And I feel like that's where we're at right now. Right now, we're just trying to figure out, well, what are the, leg the legalities? Like, what happens if it accidentally gets dropped or broken? Um, will the insurance cover it? So those are some of the things we're navigating through now, but we're hoping to, by the end of the year, have that figured out so that our youth has the access to the equipment sooner than later. Yeah, and I think that's so beautiful. I feel like a lot of times um, people, and I know that you've experienced this, before that people feel like they they're not listening to the needs of a community or a person and just kind of like throw a bunch of stuff and say like hey this is what you need or let me just spend a bunch of money on like fixing this part without actually partnering and listening to what the needs are and so i appreciate that yeah. you have like been so vocal about like the the experience that you're going through because I feel like it opens people's eyes mm -hmm. to what reality is instead of what people think reality is mm -hmm. because they don't know or they're not in this situation but they only they have their own perceived uh, biases opinions on what, how they could come and save a situation. Yeah, and I think that's a challenge that I'm constantly having to be aware of and something mm -hmm. that I tell my board and my staff, like we are not here to save Maywood and um, we take a very different approach in terms of what does it look like to co-create together. So prior to the one week intensive, we held a meeting with the youth and said, 
let's dream and imagine together what this could look like. And so we created the One Week Intensive actually based off of their interests and the types of workshops that they were looking to, um, to learn from. So it wasn't me saying, hey, these are the workshops we're doing, and this is how we're going to do it. No, we created the One Week Intensive based off of the, the specific needs of the youth and what they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to um, include their voices, because their voices are so needed, and they yeah. have strong voices and strong opinions. and they want to feel seen and heard too. And so that's something we really want to make sure that we're doing is that we are partnering with our youth to co-create or co-design what our, um, we have our mission and our vision set, but what our programming is going to look like. Yeah, and I love that because I feel like the industry that we come from, the wedding industry, is completely opposite. Like mm -hmm. you're taught like, oh no, you need to do a workshop and teach this specific thing because this person needs that mm -hmm. or you need to come into this workshop because you need this mm -hmm. um so yeah i love what you're doing and okay. like shifting the narrative i want to do a hard pivot because i want to talk about what you mean when you say you're my oily best friend yes oh my gosh so I have been on a health and wellness journey for over 10 years now. That's just been yeah. a part of my story. Um, I've had a lot of gut issues. I have thyroid, which now has turned into an autoimmune condition called Hashimoto's. And so I've just been on this journey of trying to learn and what does it mean to advocate for myself and my health um, and find different ways that I can be able to do that, whether it's through diet, now with essential oils, um, and so much more. And, um, and for me, I think this journey really started because we didn't always have the resources to see the kind of doctors who could help us um, because either we didn't have insurance or because um, the investment was just a lot that we couldn't take on on that time. And so I've had to kind of figure out ways that could help support my own health and wellness journey. So I started using oils, essential oils, about five years ago but I really didn't make it a part of my like everyday life until about two years ago. And so now I am a Young Living distributor and I love it. And one of my biggest convictions and challenges have been, what does it look like to help equip and partner with other friends of color to help them see that there are other alternative options out there? not against medicine. I don't think medicine or doctors are bad, but I think there can be a healthy, beautiful balance between um, being proactive with their health and then when needed to see a doctor, we could see a doctor. And so um, it's just, it's something I'm super passionate about. I love it. I joke around and I tell everyone on Instagram, I'm going to be your oily best friend. Um, and really what that means is let's journey together. Let's learn together. I don't know it all. I don't have it all figured out. Um, I'm on my own journey of figuring out what this means and looks like for me and my family. Um, but one of the biggest reasons why I got into essential oils was because of my own mental health. So around, um, it's all around the same time of this like whole like gaining language, going to therapy, um, mental health was became a really strong issue. Um, not an issue, that's not the word I want to use. Um, it became prevalent in my life and I think it was always there. I just hadn't pay att paid attention to the warning signs. Mm -hmm. So I received the official diagnoses of, diagnoses of um, depression, anxiety, and then PTSD for some of yep. the childhood trauma that I had experienced. And so I wanted to use um, with the approval of my doctor, um, always, I wanted to use supplements and essential oils as a way to help me through my journey and see if that could help. Um, my doctor was totally okay with it. She said, "You have." She said, "Jasmine, it's one or the other. You absolutely need something. Not doing something's not an option." And I'm okay with you using supplements and essential oils. It's gonna take time, whichever route you go. Um, but I, I need you to make a decision. So I made the decision with the supplements and said, I'll give myself three, four months to see if they help. And if they don't, then I need to make the transition into um, going the prescription route. But luckily my body responded well with the regimen that I was doing in partnership with my doctor. I'm gonna make sure, in partnership with my doctor. <laughs> um, but now I'm growing a community of other 
uh, friends and ladies um, who are majority are people of color and it's just been an amazing opportunity to do essential oils and to really connect it with our cultural um, history and identity and I think that's where I'm at now present in this season is trying to identify um, in what ways can I connect with that part of my ancestral history um, being Puerto Rican and Mexican um, as a little kid, I had these memories with my grandma before she moved back to Puerto Rico. My hair wouldn't grow when I was three years old. And so I had memories of her just like lathering like coconut oil all over my head to make my hair grow. And then recently, um, I learned from my dad that my grandmother and his mom on, on his side um, used to have an herbal garden and she would make oils from it. And so... Um, and he unfortunately doesn't have any of our recipes or anything and so that just made my heart really sad that a piece of our um, ancestral history has now been lost and so I'm on this quest of what does it look like to learn more about my ancestors and past generations and how they used herbs and oils as a way to help maintain their health and wellness. Yeah and I feel like these conversations are what is really important to keep our uh, culture, our cultural legacy yes. alive. Because like you, I was not taught how to cook any like Mexican meals and I am doing the work now to like learn that stuff mm -hmm. and teach myself and find people that are going to walk me through what that looks like. And because it's so important to be able to pass that down. Mm -hmm. um, but I really appreciate how you talk about mental health and how you talk about, like even in the oil oily uh, business, like that space is also, to me, before I knew you, like talking about it, what is a very white space. Yeah. And I really appreciate that you, you are making... Um, room for other people of color to see themselves doing this business because it's another stream of income that mm -hmm. can potentially like help them transition either from the work that they're doing to something else that they're passionate mm -hmm. for or just be a supplemental income that they can like invest in their own family yeah um, in my own financial journey, too, around the same time, one of the greatest advices or things that I kept hearing was you need to diversify your income. You can't just have all your streams of income coming in one bucket. And so last year is when I started doing the oily business. And I'm like, I'm doing this, one, because I believe in it, but two, we need to diversify our income. Um, and I am so grateful that I did that because now with COVID, it drying up my wedding season, yeah. <laughs> no longer being able to do weddings right now um, for not in, who knows until when. Um, while it's not at a place yet, my business is still young, it's still growing, but it's a stream of income that's still at least coming in that hasn't been lost due to um, the government shutdown and so or the shutdown of Illinois. And so for me, I'm just really grateful that I've been intentional over the last year or so in trying to figure out how to diversify my streams of income, and even, again, gaining language, because I don't think that's something that, at least for me, that's not something that was taught. Like, how do you build generational wealth? How do you diversify income? Like, what does that even mean? Mm -hmm. What is passive and residual income? And so for me, I chose to partner with Young Living to be able to um, do that. And you know, everyone's story within the Young Living business is different. For some, it takes a few years to really see results. For some, it takes a lot of years. And so I'm just sitting in this as uh, income potential for what it can be in the future. Right now, I'm just laying the foundation and focusing on really building authentic community and really creating, again, a space at the table that says, hey, we're here <laughs> and there's nothing weird about it. It's not brujeria. Like, yeah. um, I think we've been so um, constructed to believe that anything other than Western medicine is wrong. And so that's something that I'm seeing 
coming to the forefront is the more I'm leading classes and connecting with other Latinas and Latinos, um, debunking some of the ideas around what does it mean to use essential oils and how can you implement them as a part of your health and wellness journey. Yeah, and I specifically appreciate you sharing how um, like mental health is a real thing. Yeah. I feel like I have shared a little bit about it on like social media. I talk more about it when I'm like one on one, mm-hmm. um, but especially in like the Latino community, it's not it's considered. So taboo. Yeah, yes. it's not like a thing. <laughs> and so, like my journey, I kept really quiet. Like even uh, talking about it with my family, mm-hmm. um, I've just kind of gone through certain parts of it alone Mm -hmm. and so I recently started sharing and have been like really overwhelmed with encouragement and saying like hey no one talks about this stuff I really appreciate it and even like I feel like mental health or like your that journey or even seeing someone and talking through that stuff is like I know that first time I went to a therapist I was like hey these are the things that I'm struggling with at home and can you help me like navigate some things that I'm that I'm coming across in my kids? Yes. And she uh, said, "Well, what about you?" And I was just like, "What do you mean? What about me?" <laughs> She's like, "Have you like what's your anxiety like and what's yes. your stress level?" And I'm just like, I, "I'm not here to talk about me. I'm here to talk like give me some resources so I can help my kids." And so that's um, like another thing. Like we don't think about mental health as something that we can go through because it's so taboo. Like, you just don't talk about it. It's like, Um, you don't talk about anything. It's swept under the rug. You don't talk about feelings. You don't talk about any of that. Um, Absolutely. So mental health, I call myself a mental health advocate. I'm just like, I'm just like, that's my advice to anybody. Go to therapy. Like, if you can do it, do it. Like, if you don't have insurance, there's other options out there there's tons of nonprofits that offer like you know eight to twelve weeks of free sessions um it's getting it's finding out about those resources and connecting with the resources because they exist and they're out there and they're available but it's really first getting in the over that hump of destigmatizing or normalizing is the language that i use normalizing mental health and and recognizing that this is something we need to be talking more about and that we're not crazy we're not crazy because we're sad. We're not crazy because we have depression or anxiety. Like, yeah. like this is okay. We can live beyond it. And there's coping skills that we can learn mm-hmm. um, to overcome, you know, our, our struggles with it. Yeah. Or we shouldn't just suck it up yeah. and like, move on, uh, which is something that I am working through. Because mm-hmm. usually I just tell myself, look, this is just how it is. Suck it up. Let's move on. Yeah. Um, but yes, I like how you are an advocate and you speak openly about it because there i feel like it's so important to see someone speaking on it that looks like them and can understand their cultural uh upbringing yeah um i think it is important to find someone who's culturally competent though yes because you know if you're going to see a therapist with again majority white um you they have to be culturally competent Mm -hmm. or find someone who is competent and understands the nuances and complexities of our lived experiences because then it's going to be through a very narrow lens and it's not going to be helpful yes for sure i feel like even though i was going through to a therapist at one point i felt like there were some parts of me that i was still keeping to myself um same here yeah the same thing so So yeah, so I appreciate your advocacy and I appreciate you uh, tying and speaking about the oils to our culture because a lot of times, like I said, we only see, uh, we don't see a lot of people of color Mm -hmm. doing this type of business uh, and not, and especially tying it back to our roots Mm -hmm. and acknowledging the cultural aspects of what oils and pursuing mental wellness Mm -hmm. and health wellness uh, means 
like to our culture. Yeah, and typically we're only like a generation or two separated from from being migrant workers. So my great grandfather from Puerto Rico, he was a farmer. And so that is, it's in my bloodline. It is in my ancestral history to work with the land and the plants and to use it as a form of living. Um, and so the more I'm learning that, the more I'm like, just, I wanna learn more, yeah. share more, I wanna learn. Um, so I'm actually working on um, potentially taking an herbalism course um, with a woman who's from Africa, but lives in Puerto Rico with the Taino community. And so I'm super excited to like, just like learn from her and, yeah. and for it to be not white centered mm -hmm. um, and to learn from her lived experience and then recognizing how cool would it be to like go back to Puerto Rico because for me, Puerto Rico is an area of trauma for me. And so how crazy would it be that the place that is the most place of trauma for me is also a place that could be the most healing yeah. um, as I do this herbalism program through her. So I don't know, I'm not 100% sure yet if I'm going to do it, but I'm like pretty sure I am. And um, I'm just excited for what's to come and to continue to dive in deeper and really identify how to connect with that part of myself and then help others to connect with it and to, and to realize that this is so ingrained in our culture and there's nothing taboo about it. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> I can't wait to hear yeah. when you uh, take that. What I decide. We'll yeah. see. <laughs> um, okay, so I do want to talk about, um, I feel like a lot of what I do is to talk about these topics and, um, but also send out encouragement for the next generation. Yes. I, I, the things I do is for my kids to be able to pass down my culture, for them to see and be proud of their Mexican heritage, their Mexican roots, and to be able to uh, pass that down to their kids mm -hmm. as well and to continue this education. So I wanna ask you, what is the most inspiring feedback that you've walked through to bring you to this place, to the present? Okay, good question, good question. I've been thinking about this. I'm like, how do I answer this? Um, I would say, and let me know if I'm answering the question not in the way that you intended it to be. Um, I think the greatest feedback that I am receiving from, from friends and from those who are watching and listening to our story has just been like, wow, your vulnerability and transparency is so inspiring. And if I can, if you can do this and I can see you doing it because you've allowed for us to be the part of the process, mm -hmm. then maybe I can do it too. And so it's giving others hope that their dreams, that their hopes and desires are possible. And, um, and so that's been like the greatest feedback I have received. Am I answering your question yes. right? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Another, um, uh, some more feedback that I'm receiving is again, with just like the health and wellness, mental health is huge. I get so many, especially people of color reaching out saying, thank you so much for talking about this. Um, I actually want to see a therapist, but I don't have insurance. Like, who can I see? I think there's tons, tons of people guide people towards finding someone who has, who takes insurance, and that could be very limiting. And so I've had a lot, reach, a lot of friends reach out to me and say, where can I get help where I don't have insurance, but maybe they do a sliding scale. Mm -hmm. So I've been putting a resource list together so that friends, no matter where you fall on the income level, at least know of different options that are available for them. Yeah. Yeah, that, you answered the question. That's <laughs> okay. It. Um, and so I know that it has been a journey to get through, but I want other people to know that even like they've experienced some of these things and maybe this is the first time people are hearing a conversation like this. Maybe it's the second, third, or they've been hearing it but it hasn't like struck mm -hmm. a chord or they mm -hmm. haven't like had that moment of oh this is I've I've experienced this too yeah. can you talk about like what past ideas or patterns or limiting beliefs you've had to work through because mm -hmm. I feel like when we talk about 
the patterns and those the things that have like held us back or have been those pivot points like that's where people can start to relate like oh I had that or mm -hmm. like I thought that and that's not true um, so can you share a little bit yeah so okay so I think the biggest thing for me was getting into therapy like mm -hmm. I stalled so long <laughs> when I finally found someone that I thought could be a good fit for me. I stalled like even like three, four months before reaching out and then another month to actually mm -hmm. get an appointment scheduled. Yeah. So I would say um, overcome whatever limiting beliefs that you have about therapy and what that means and what that looks like. It's a challenge. Um, there's going to be a lot of exposing, a lot of uprooting, and I think that's part of the process. We need to uproot lies and beliefs and limiting beliefs that we've believed about ourselves. So some of the things that were exposed to me was poverty mindset or limited thinking. Um, I wasn't aware of it, but um, there's this thing called maladaptive mindsets that I learned through my therapist. There's like 18 of them, and um, I don't know. I would say that especially for those who have experienced trauma, we tend to play out out of them. And so for me, the two that I recognized immediately was abandonment. So I mentioned that I was raised by a single mom. Um, my dad left before I was born. And so while my relationship has been um, reconciled and healed with him and we're like on amazing terms, the damage of abandonment and how it impacted my brain was still there. And so I needed to learn coping skills through therapy and how to rewrite those pathways in my brain so that I can not operate out of an abandonment mentality. And so the way that I saw that playing out was in my relationships, in my friendships. I took on this belief that everyone I loved at some point would leave me or die. Mm -hmm. um, and I was actually confronted by that with a friend who was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, she had battled it, went into remission or no evidence of disease, and then it came back and she ended up passing away from breast cancer. And that season and that friendship for me was one of the most healing friendships that I had experienced because it was an invitation for me to really confront the lie that my friend might die. But that doesn't mean she doesn't love me or care for me as a friend. And so what does it look like for me to be a friend for her in this season through her journey? And so that was something I had to confront and overcome was that not everyone is going to leave me because of a certain reason. Um, and that was really hard for me. I think that's, I'm still navigating through that. I still struggle with it. Um, another thing was it's called failure to succeed. So I took on this mindset that everyone around me is meant to succeed but me. Mm -hmm. So when I saw my friends in the wedding industry that started around the same time as me, getting 20, 30 bookings a year, yeah. and I was getting only five, mm -hmm. I believed it's because I'm not meant to succeed. And so that was another thing that I needed to overcome and confront and really challenge that, no, there is enough of the pie right? Not operating out of scarcity, but out of abundance mm -hmm. and believing that there's enough of the pie, not just for my friends to thrive, but there's enough for me to thrive too. And what does that look like? And then the last thing, which partners with that a little bit is poverty mindset. So just believing my life is a, meant to be a life of struggle. It's mm -hmm. meant to be one of lack. Um, and um, and not, I'm not one who believes in like prosperity gospel or anything like that, but really challenging the mindsets around the American dream, you know, what does it look like to have this perfect life, yeah. challenging that um, while saying what does it look like to live within my means, within my budget, mm -hmm. and while I may not be quote unquote financially on paper where we might want to be, but what does it look like to be free in my mind and to know that we can manage and steward and live a full life with the budget that we have. And then also my money perceptions. So my relationship with money. So growing up in a low income home, not really knowing, you know, is the fridge going to be empty? Mm -hmm. Are we going to be able to do laundry at the laundromat this week? And so those were different things that I had to overcome and believe that, that, that my life is, I don't know. And I don't even know if I want to say that because I think struggle is a part of life. And so 
this idea that our life is never going to be one of struggle, I think is not true. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think we're going to have highs and we're going to have lows. There's going to be seasons where we have much and there's going to be seasons where we don't. And so how do we navigate through that and how do we find contentment in the process of that? Mm -hmm. And that's really what I had to confront, that, that maybe the American dream really isn't all that it is and maybe my ideas don't fall in alignment with it. And so what does that look like and what does that mean for me as an individual mm -hmm. and as a family? Yeah, that's so good. Thank you for, yeah. for sharing all of that. Um, so how would you, uh, like then take that and send out encouragement or advice or, um, just something for the next generation to be lifted up and, and built up? Yes. So I'm a tangible person. I like to give some practical yeah. ideas and what you can do. So something that I tell my friends is I... I tell you, I tell my friends, I'm like, create a joy and meaningful list. Um, because what brings me joy and meaning may not bring you joy and meaning. Mm -hmm. So for me, what brings me joy is decor and making my house look cute on a budget, right? And so because that is something that gives me meaning, I can stay rooted in that. Versus maybe you love like fashion and plants. And so you allocate a budget and your lifestyle around that. But that's what brings you joy. Mm -hmm. And so that's okay. Um, so that's what I tell people. I'm like, first, identify a joy and meaningful list. What brings you joy? What brings you meaning and purpose? And then from there, it helps you funnel through the decisions that you're going to make, right? So for us, we're in experiences over things, family. For us, experiences bring us joy. So we don't have a budget to just buy things for the kids. We create our budget around, and I know I'm staying budget-minded, but I think it's all interconnected. Yeah. And I say that because for us, we want the experiences with our kids. And why do we want the experiences for our kids? Because we didn't have that when we were young. My husband and I both grew up in single-parent homes. Um, and so we're trying to write a new legacy for our kids. And experiences for us is where it's at. So we allocate the, our decisions, the way we live, based off of the things that bring us joy and meaning. Another thing I love to share with my friends is, and you could do this all in a journal, um, another thing you can do is, is take some time to write down the lies that you believe about yourself. Ooh. Yeah. And I, I continually do That's this good. in my journal. Write down the lies that you believe about yourself and then find either affirmations or if you're a person of faith, scripture, that combats that lie with truth and partner that Partner yourself with the truth versus the lie. Um, and then the last thing that I invite my friends to do is create an imagine list. Um, and I think imagining is very different than dreaming. I think dreaming leads to goal setting mm -hmm. and creating physical goals. I think imagination leads eventually leads to dreaming, but imagination allows for us to take any sort of limitations that we have about ourselves and take them off and really write down things that maybe we think that we can't do. So for me, that was the firehouse. Yeah. I had that on my list. I was like, there's no way we can buy a firehouse. Um, there's no way we can do the nonprofit. It, right there I believe these lies there, there's no way we could fund the firehouse dream and so I would write down things on my imagine list like the firehouse financial freedom um, being fully funded um, brand new windows in the house right and and I kid you not the more I have imagined the more it has allowed my brain the creativity to figure out how these things can become a reality which then leads to dreaming, which then leads to goal setting. And so those are some tools that I would, or recommendations that I would make in terms of how to combat um, maybe some lies that we believe about ourselves and really trying to live from our authentic selves. Yeah, that is so good. I'm going to have to like re-listen to this <laughs> yeah. and like write down and take notes. Uh, yeah, that is really good. Um, I am so grateful that I have had the opportunity to have a friendship with you yes. and to grow with you Likewise. To, together. <laughs> um, but like, I really appreciate you being able to sit down and have this conversation with me because every time I leave, I said in the beginning, every time I leave uh, a hangout with you, I'm like so inspired 
and encouraged and I just wish that other people could like have that poured into them as well um, and to be inspired to dive in and look into their own lives and to become like challenged and and grow and learn so that they can then impact the next generation yes. uh, so thank you so much thank before you. we leave <laughs> i want you to share where everyone can find you yes i'm mostly on instagram um, it's Authentic Adventure Co. All together, no spaces or underscore. And then the Firehouse Dream is the same thing. The Firehouse Dream, no spaces or underscore. Yeah. So that's where you can find us. That's great. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for having me. <laughs> if you watched Issa's episode last week and then watched Jasmine's episode this week, you'll notice how much the blonde in my hair has grown out since the first time and how my makeup this time around is like the most basic ever, COVID life. Uh, but since this was filmed, I was asked to be part of the board for the Firehouse Dream, which I'm super honored to be part of such an amazing vision. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy this chat with Jasmine. You can find all of her information on the website, elevatinglacultura.com. And like I said in the interview, if you enjoyed this chat, this conversation, please share, send me a DM. I always like to hear from people and how they have resonated with the stories that I share. So go and enjoy the rest of your day, afternoon, evening, whenever you're listening. Y nos vemos next week. <laughs>